All right, very, very quickly, let me introduce the speakers. We've got a lot of speakers today, both um, professional trainers and also people from around the bar industry as well. Not just the bar industry in the United States, but uh, some of the leading bar operators, owners and managers from around the world. But very, very quickly, I guess the four of us that are really putting together the nuts and bolts of this, um, we all work for uh, Bacardi, both Bacardi Globally and Bacardi USA, so the sponsors of today's talk, and we're the ones that have helped put this together. So let me introduce first of all Mr. Ian McLaren, who's the uh, Director of Trade Advocacy and Training for Bacardi USA. Ian's got more than, oh no, sorry, this is your 20th year, right? This is my 20th year, yeah. yeah. Um, and uniquely, Ian's <coughs> been a trainer since uh, 2000, and he was one of the very, very first full-time professional trainers, not just for any liquor company, but for, for, uh, for bar groups as well. Starting in Edinburgh, if you've ever had the opportunity to go to Edinburgh, it probably has the best small cocktail scene per capita of any city on the planet. Um, and a huge part of that is, is, in, is down to the work that Ian and, and people he trained and mentored who have now gone on, on to open amazing bars, both in Edinburgh, London, and around the world. Uh, so you can follow him at The Bar Trainer. Next up, to my left and your right, we have Jennifer Contraveus, who is a National Training Manager at Bacardi USA. Um, Jennifer's got 15 years industry experience in all kinds of venues, including 10 as a, uh, as a bartender. She's worked for top restaurateurs like Thomas Keller, worked for casino groups, for uh, small speakeasies, um, and I like to call her America's winningest female bartender. All right, so I think the, the long list of things that you've won is uh, fairly extensive. Angostura, 42 below, uh, the amazing uh, speed rack competition, um, and you can follow Jennifer at, Contra at uh, Crafted Cocktail. Sorry. I'm not sure if you've noticed yet, but I'm also the only one that's not heavily accented, so. <laughs> so, so if anyone has trouble understanding what these gentlemen are saying, yeah. don't worry, I have no idea what the hell they're talking about either. <laughs> In fact, so we've got, we've got one Australian, one Scot, uh, one American, and one New Zealander, but that's, we're just getting started. Then we've got a, uh, a Sri Lankan Briton, uh, we've got a Czech, uh, we were going to have a Northern Irishman. If you think I'm hard to understand, you should try going to the dead rabbit. Um, all right. So next we have Adrian Biggs, uh, who's again another national training manager for Bacardi USA. Um, Adrian's been in the hospitality business since he was 15. So um, he lives in Los Angeles, which means he wouldn't tell us how many years that is. Um, but, <laughs> He has to lie about his age. In fact, one of the reasons that there are so many cameras here, I think, is probably because of you. This is actually Adrian's brooding boy band shot. Um, and again, he's from LA, so he's not on Twitter. He's only on Instagram. So you can follow him at Big Z9. Um, and Adrian's worked in all manner of venues, right, from um, famous speakeasies like La Descarga um, in Los Angeles, all the way through to huge casino operations and even for Disney. Um, so, then uh, very, very quickly, there's myself. So, so this is Jacob Briars, yeah. <laughs> uh, who, who you may have come across before. Jacob is a, a legend in his own lunchtime, one of the veterans <laughs> of Tales, who uh, probably can be classed as one of the founding fathers, and a former Golden Spirit Award winner, last year's uh, Best International Brand Ambassador, mm. the Spirited Awards. Uh, so we're privileged to be in his company. You can follow him on a, a number of different platforms at, <laughs> at Vodka Professor, and uh, he classes himself as a in professional inter international barfly. <laughs> So it's been a long time since I made a decent drink, but uh, I get to travel the world a lot for work and I've sat in probably in front of every great, well, a lot of the great bartenders of the world and in as many of the great bars. And so I guess that leads us on to, you know, why are we doing this, right? So why are the four of us, right? So why are we here um, trying to tell you, professional bartenders, bar managers, and even bar owners, how to run your businesses better? It's a very simple example. Now, again, Jennifer, you're going to have to tell us who this is and what sport. Is the guy on the left a motorbike driver? Um, <laughs> anyway, very, very quickly, if you, I'm sure most of you know, certainly if you're from the United States, this is Vince Lombardi, probably the most famous American football coach. Um, and we, we very much use the idea of the coach or the manager as being somebody who didn't necessarily happen to be the greatest player. In fact, in most instances, they're not. Right? They probably they have a good rudimentary understanding of whatever game they may coach, uh, but they were certainly not championship material. But what they do tend to be very, very good at is distilling the very, very best practice that they see around the world and getting the best out of their people. Um, and so we like to see ourselves as very much kind of the football manager of, of that uh, of, of the bar world. We train a lot of people, we take the very best things that we see both in the United States and around the world uh, and we try to give that back to, to bars and restaurants and the training that we do every single day around the world. So that's us. Cool. All right, very, very quickly, today's agenda. Um, between 10.30 and 12.30, we're going to work on what we see the fundamental things are. I guess probably the very, the very, very first thing. If you've turned up here to try to work out how to run your rosters, um, how to hire and fire people, uh, whether a mojito should cost $12 or $13, 
These are essential parts. These are the granular nuts and bolts of bar management, but that's not really what we're going to get into today. In fact, we're going to spend probably the first two hours talking about stuff which almost has nothing to do with the day-to-day -day bar management, but it's essential because it sets the agenda, the tone, the culture for everything else you're doing. That's basically the vision, your service strategy, the guest experience that you want to be providing, and then based on your vision and your guest experience, who is the team that you need to build, how do you train them to be the right people, and how do you keep them there doing exactly what you want? Right, so we use the example. How many of you, first of all, who's a bar manager here? Cool, most of you. Owners, any owners? Cool, all right, so how many, who's got a, uh, say, 10 staff? A couple, 20? Any more than that, five? All right, so you're all here, you've all taken the week off, right? And, uh, well, not really. You're here, here in a professional capacity. And you are basically here, I think, probably because you either want to improve your business, you might have been open 10 weeks, you might be opening in 10 weeks, or you might have been open 10 years. Um, but one of the essential components, really, more than you can only, you know, you can't clone yourselves, right? And looking at most of you, we say, thank God, right? But <laughs> you can only be one person, and your job as a su successful bar manager, operator, owner, is really to inspire the people around you to try and get the very best out of them. So we're going to spend almost two hours really discussing that. How do you build the vision? How do you create the culture? How do you get people to do what, well, how do you get people to see that they should be doing what you want them to do? Um, then we're going to break for lunch, and then between one and three, we're going to work on a bit more of the nuts and bolts. So once you've established your platform and your culture, we're going to get into the operation side, right? So um, how, do you, how, do you, how do you create a, uh, a menu that your guests are going to want to order from? How do you make sure that your mix of beverages, your drinks, are the, the right sorts of things for your venue? How do you make sure that they're delivering at the right price? Um, and is price even important, right? We're going to show you that may not may be a lot less important than you think. And then once you've got your menu and your pricing and your, your team in place, how do you make sure they're all delivering at peak performance? Then we're going to take a quick break, and then we're going to work on kind of the nuts and bolts of growing your business. So once you've got, all of, once you've got it humming efficiently, how do you start to grow and expand? So could that be you know, getting a second venue open? Could that be growing your brand, uh, becoming the most famous bar in your city or country? And then sometimes, one of, the, uh, one of my favorite corporate quotes you often hear is, uh, Steve Jobs said, the only, you know, if you don't cannibalize yourself, somebody else will. Right, so if you've got a successful venue that's winning lots of awards, that's the time you need to start thinking about tweaking uh, your offering, reinventing yourself. And we're going to bring in a couple of people who are specialists in that and, uh, and never doing the same thing twice. Um, should we do a quick mission statement? Does anybody, anybody know what, it is, what the uh, image is on the right? Titanic? Titanic? Yep. It's, uh, well, it's actually, this one is actually, so in, in the corporate world, you've, sorry, you had your hand up? A ship too late to save a drowning witch. It's probably the best piece of art ever put on a cocktail napkin. Um, this is what's called a droodle, and they were very, very popular in the 50s and 60s, usually you know, for pickup artists, actually, um, who would sit there in a, in a bar whilst waiting for a cocktail and, and draw a droodle. Um, and they were kind of, what we wanted to do very, very quickly before we do anything else is to, is to talk about kind of establishing your vision, which we want, you know, your vision basically needs to be one sentence. What are your goals in this industry? What are you trying to do? Um, and what we wanted you to do, first of all, is to take the stack of napkins that are in front of you, and if it can't fit on a napkin, it's not a vision, right? So if your vision is longer than you can write on that, then it's too long, because what you're going to find, one of the fundamental problems that happens in the bar business is if you have to keep explaining what it is that you're doing to your customers, your staff, your suppliers, your investors, then uh, you will be, you'll be spending most of your time explaining that. Right? So you want to really try and, try and create a clear and distinct vision, which is going to everything else that you do in this industry is going to flow from that. How many staff are we going to hire? What's the guest experience? What are the sorts of drinks that we want to offer? All things are going to flow from your, your basic essential reason for being here. So we're going to do this a few times throughout the day. So that stack of napkins that's, that's in front of you is going to end up as a stack of napkins with your writing on them, hopefully. Um, what we'd like you to do just right now is write down what you feel your vision for the venue that you work in is. Okay, just take a couple of minutes to do that. Thank you very much. How are you getting on? Everyone done? Cool, if it's taking you longer than a minute, then that's probably the first of the problems we'll try and address today, because your mission statement should be very, very short and punchy. Um, a mission statement, again, is another kind of corporate buzzword you'll hear a lot of. Um, and, I mean, to give you an idea of you know, how punchy a mission statement should be, we get, we get the term from President Kennedy, who said, by the end of the decade, America will put a man on the moon. 
right? Very, very simple, very, very clear. Every single person who heard it understood exactly what was meant by it. Um, and they did it by you know, a matter of five months. They snuck a man on the moon, more may of, it depends. If you spend too much on Bur time on Bourbon Street after midnight, you'll meet people who tell you they didn't put a man on the moon. Um, but, but generally, you know, very, very clear, distinct vision. And when we go around the world and around the, this country and we, we talk to operators, the ones who are performing most successfully with staff who are incredibly engaged, staff who don't tend to leave, customers who are happy to spend whatever price point the bar sets, they tend to be the bars that have a very, very clear idea about what it is they're offering, what's their kind of, and they have a broader idea that's much bigger than just making money, right? Much bigger than just selling drinks. So being profitable in this business is, is not the end goal, right? Of course, you know, your business plan says it is. You should try and make money. But making money in the bar business is a byproduct of excellence, right? Very, very simple. If you think that your business plan is here, you, the, your, your job in this business is to make money, then you're doing it wrong. Right, so what we want to do is kind of pitch at a much, much higher idea. What it is that you're trying to do for your city, for your suburb, uh, for your country even, uh, in terms of in, in this industry, in the hospitality business. Cool. Do you want to do this? So when you look at your vision statement, there are certain components that you need to have. And to write a great vision statement, you really need to have a very clear idea of what you're trying to achieve. I think the most important thing about this is to ask yourself now these following questions, okay? So what is your mission in the business? What are you trying to achieve? Okay, so we're going to take two minutes to do all of these at the same time. So just hold on. So what's your mission in the business? What are you trying to achieve? What 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 is your personal goal? Okay, that's the first thing, um, and that should probably run into the second one about why do you want to run or own a bar. You've already done what is your vision, and then where do you want to go and where do you want to take people? Okay, so actually think about these fundamental questions. Where do you want to take people is very important because having a great vision is all about really bringing people with you, taking people along with you. And if you're sitting here kind of half at the back of your mind thinking about the shift that you're not currently running yourself, wondering how it's going, there's probably a fairly good chance that your staff don't necessarily understand exactly what your personal vision is for what's going on in the venue you work in or own. Okay? So, Take a second to do this. If we could concentrate on the first one, so what is your personal mission in the business? Why do you want to run or own a bar? And then the last one, where do you want to go? And write those three things down, okay? You can do one napkin each or you can do one napkin for all three. It's entirely up to you. If right, who's, who's sort of finished with a, uh, a, a vision statement and a mission statement? Cool. And feels confident of... enough to share it. Yeah. Cool. Um, so I get my next little bits or uh, boys and girls. And that one says, uh, if our providers all those sports enthusiasts, the upscale establishment is filled with passion for sports, food, and entertainment through an inviting environment, consistently delivered, great customer service, and a quality product while supporting the tradition of our club. Nice. Wow. It's extensive, covers a lot of ground. Very cool. I think that's, that's definitely a mission rather than a vision. I think that's what you're trying to achieve. It's, very, it's a very valid and very thorough piece of work, and it's a great, a great thing. So I think this is interesting. So when you guys are writing these things down, if you're finding the mission and the vision hard to distinguish from each other, I think you've kind of hit the nail on the head there, and that's great. So the mission really is kind of the nuts and bolts around what you're trying to, what you're actually physically trying to do. And the vision is really something which is much broader than that. It's something that's a bigger topic, something that you're trying to um, kind of push the boundaries on uh, and sort of reach for the stars, essentially put them out on the moon and bring them back. That's your vision. Um, how you're going to go about it and why, why you're doing it, that's really your mission. So that's a, kind of, that's a very good point to make. So sometimes you could probably look at this and say, well, you know, I'm just selling drinks or I'm just selling uh, cocktails. But the truly successful businesses here find a way to translate the, you know, their offering effectively, so what it is that they're actually selling to guests, and turn it into a much, much bigger picture. We'll dwell on that a little bit. But, you know, so just, just selling, sorry. So if you finish doing those three questions, so the mission of the business, why you want to run or own a bar, where do you want to go, go back to the original vision statement that you wrote and revisit it in light of the three questions you've just considered, okay? Has your vision changed in light of the things you've written down? We'll keep coming back to that as well because this is kind of the essential thing. You know, on a post-it note or on a cocktail napkin, this is the thing you want to have so tight that your staff can, you know, can say it to every single guest. In fact, they almost don't even need to say it because it should permeate every single thing that they do. Uh, throughout their career in hospitality.
All right, very, very quickly, just uh, we're going to talk very, very quickly, kind of at a broader level, almost above hospitality, just about kind of successful businesses and the way in which they translate what it is that they're selling and understand how to kind of pitch it as a bigger idea. So very, very quickly, this is, um, we won't dwell too much on time on this because we certainly don't want to get into consumer psychology, but this is a, a very, very famous pyramid called the Maslow's Pyramids of Needs, or as... As, as Ian uh, read, I have terrible handwriting. I trained as a lawyer, but I should have been a doctor. And as he read from my, uh, my, my notes, Moscow's Pyramid of Weed, um, <laughs> which I guess would make for a very interesting talk. It anyway, did, very, very quickly, like in that. the bar business, as I'm sure you probably know, right, the, the functional need, or even more than that, the, the, the very, very primal human need for the tavern, the bar, the restaurant, dried up about 150 years ago. So for 8,000 years, we bars, taverns, public houses existed in order to make water safe to drink. So ever since the arrival of, of potable tap water, there's never, there hasn't really been a need for the bar anymore, right? At a pure kind of primal level. So you know, what is what, what is it that we're doing that's uh, that's uh, kind of saving lives? Yeah, right. So you know, we're, we're not curing cancer here. Then you have your second kind of need, which is security. So to use a kind of a hospitality example, um, somewhere to sleep. Is, uh, is a primal physiological need. Somewhere to sleep that's comfortable, all right, where the door that locks kind of provides you security. So you could probably find somewhere to sleep in New Orleans that would keep the rain off your head, but um, having a lockable door is probably a, something that's significant that you're prepared to pay for, right? Which is probably why most of you are staying in hotels here. What bars really do um, is the next two things. They create a sense of belonging and community. Right? This is why the idea of the neighbourhood tavern, the neighbourhood bistro, the, the, you know, the, the corner bar, the sports bar for your locals, this is where you really start to hit the sweet spot. Because this is people for whom they're actually prepared to pay far more than they otherwise would for the privilege and the opportunity of, of forging a sense of community, of creating a sense of belonging, of having a bartender or a waiter or a maitre d' that recognises them when they come in. And this becomes a community that they might not all the, otherwise have. This is why you tend to find, you know, um, places like, you know, the, the bar, particularly the old style kind of corner tavern, such an essential part in old neighbourhoods. And then finally, kind of the next part, which is esteem, right? Making people feel great. And that's, so uh, part three, belonging, that's what you should be doing as a fundamental. But the bit where you really can start to be a successful business with customers who keep coming back and will pay whatever price you deem necessary, that's when you really start to put your offering into the next part. Making people feel amazing. Right, so the best bar in the world by, by common acclaim at the moment is a bar called the Artesian at the Langham. And the drinks are insanely expensive if you look at it in kind of context. Um, and the, you know, the experience can be quite threatening to a lot of people. You've got to walk into a five-star hotel, the drinks, you know, there's no, no prices on the menu, the drinks are very expensive, everything looks very, very over the top, but they have a, an amazing way in sort of 30 seconds, 60 seconds of making you feel amazing from the very first second they get in. So you get in, they put a menu down, if you're a lady, they throw some rose petals over your head, they pour a glass of champagne, they're all smiley, very, very gregarious, and within about 30 seconds you've forgotten that you're in this, la you know, it's cost 650 pounds or about a thousand dollars a night to stay in the hotel where the bar is and the drinks are between 18 to 20 pounds so exceptionally expensive yet you'll find people who look much like you going in there because you can't put a price on that amazing experience and then the very very final part which isn't necessarily something that the industry the restaurant industry and the bar industry does well is self-actualization which is this idea of growing and evolving as a human being and you can see a small number of bars working, you know, trying to, to get to that point through things like money which gets donated to charity, trying to minimise the environmental impact either on their region or even on the planet, right? So having a much, much bigger goal that you can sign up for. Um, and, you know, very few bars get there, but when you get to that point, then there's no limit to the prices that people will pay because they feel that coming to see you in your bar or restaurant is actually helping them evolve and live as a, you know, as a human in their life. And I think the, the other important thing to bear in mind is not necessarily just about the prices that people will pay. There's actually no limits to what you can achieve once you hit that point. So you have a goal which is much bigger than your individual venue, much bigger than your individual self-worth or the, the worth of your business, the value of the business that you have. Then you have the potential to actually elevate the city that you work in, the bar culture that you work in, and many other things over and above the pure financial elements, which are, you know, can be hugely important, not just immediately, but for the future as well. A great example of this, this is probably the most famous example of a bar that everybody thinks it sells one thing, but it really doesn't. It sells something else. What, is, what does Starbucks sell? Milk. Milk? Well, that's true. If you're an espresso <laughs> snob like I am, that's all they fucking sell. All right? Milky drinks. Um, anything else? 
And experience, exactly, right? They're basically, you know, so we think of Starbucks as selling coffee, which isn't really true because there were hundreds of thousands of, of uh, cafes across America that offered coffee at all kinds of prices. And in fact, most people would probably say the coffee they sell is even, <laughs> even particularly good. Uh, but they've managed to establish more than 30,000 cafes around the world because they sell one very, very kind of special idea, which is that somewhere between walking to, you know, leaving your house and walking to work, you want to walk in and give yourself a very, very small luxury in your life, which is the $3, $4, $5 coffee, right? Which is just a kind of small, a small treat, small luxury syndrome. They also sell this idea of belonging, right? And what the Starbucks themselves call it the third place. The idea that between work and home, your guests are actually looking for something, a special experience that makes them belong. That's why Starbucks has this amazing language when you first walk in, right? So the, the drinks that they sell are in, incomprehensible, right? What the fuck does vente actually mean? It's not an Italian word, right? Grande, they have all of this language which makes no sense to anybody who's ever drunk coffee outside of Starbucks. And what it does is it sells you a very, very it's, it helps you, once you translate that language and you go in and you do your order and you rattle it off, you feel like you're part of a community when you go into Starbucks. And it's a very, very powerful thing. They own that space in the morning, right? But we own that space in the evening. Right, we're the halfway house, so you go, you leave your house, you go to Starbucks, and then you go to work, and you know, it's the little thing that gets you ready for your day. We have the great opportunity in the bar and restaurant business to do the reverse, right? So when you leave work, you come into a bar, and you kind of leave, you know, you, de you, you unbox everything that's been sitting on your shoulders since work, have a drink, spend time with your friends, establish a community. You know, it's a very, very special, powerful place to be. And the great thing about it is it can run for five hours, whereas nobody, uh, sorry. So the, one of the key things about this is it's almost like a club, essentially. Um, people feel part of something, part of a community, as Jacob pointed out. I remember being told a story by a, a coffee shop owner in, in Edinburgh, actually, who sold great quality coffee, a family business been run for a number of years, um, didn't really take off until a Starbucks opened off, over the road, insanely. So you know, what they needed was someone to teach people what to do, to build a culture around something that then became such a cult idea, the idea of walking around with a cup, paper cup with a sleeve on it, um, became a thing that people wanted to be seen doing. And that, that really is their greatest contribution to coffee culture, believe it or not. It's not necessarily the drinks that they serve, it's the idea that coffee is cool and the idea that coffee is something you want to be seen walking around with. Cool. All right, so where have we got to in, in kind of the, the bar and restaurant business, if you like? Well, embarrassingly for us, if you like, we in the bar business, if you want to know what we're going to be doing in five years' time, ask yourself what restaurants were doing five years ago. Uh, because in, in kind of the, the, the pyramid of human needs, if you like, um, you know, food is considered to be much more important than cocktails. So the restaurants, they're are more established, they get more media coverage, they're, they're, their roots run deeper. Um, and so whatever happens in the restaurant tends to filter into the bar world a couple of years later. So you can see this in a couple of great examples. So on the left, we have a dude called Marco Pierre White, who in about 1990, he eventually trained Gordon Ramsay. And if you've ever been in the restaurant business, you've probably heard his name. Um, he was completely insane um, and, you know, is a, a sort of mad egotist. And he was probably the first rock and roll chef in the sense that he, you know, all of the, everything that Gordon Ramsay and the kind of the high profile chefs since him, they learned everything they know from Marco Pierre White. You know, there was no salt and pepper on the table. If you asked for salt and pepper, he'd come out of the kitchen and kick you out. Women wearing too much perfume, out. Uh, you know, successful, uh, you know, restaurant reviewers, get the fuck out. Right, he would come out with knives sometimes and brand, you know, get people out. There were no substitutions, right? He was the artiste, he knew better, and you had to have everything on a menu his way. And we've done that probably, the, the establishing kind of rebirth of cocktail culture very much was prone to this. So on the right, you have a guy called Jonathan Downey. What's that? What's that? Are, are any of you in the, in the room from London? Or have been around London? Want to have been around London? Yeah. Okay, so three. Okay, cool. So Jonathan um, is an extraordinary force of nature and, and ran one of the sort of pivotal cocktail groups of London in the early, late 1990s, early 2000s called The Match Group. Um, he also opened several standalone venues and the key defining factor about his venues really was uh, their uncompromising um, quality agenda. Um, they also they had a very uncompromising training schedule as well, which was uh, called First Tuesdays, which, you know, kind of almost built this army of people and you can almost still to this day tell a match group bartender when you see them working. You can tell by the way they move, you can tell by the styles of drinks they make, you can tell by the way they talk about things, you can tell by the bar calls they do, all these different things and it was very much a kind of cult of personality and Jonathan is an extraordinary personality. He, he's now devoted himself, he's pushed himself more into the street food angle and he's uh, busy trying to build London's street food culture uh, as much as he was building London's bar culture back in the 1990s. 
So, I mean, the bars that he was involved in, uh, Milk and Honey, uh, ma True. Match, match bar, Trailer Happiness, they kind of, uh, London for a long period, almost 15 years, probably the far and away the most influential city in the global bar trade. And almost everything that we're doing in this country and around the world is heavily influenced by the sorts of stuff that he did. But, you know, as long as you signed up to his vision, right? So his drinks were amazing, his staff were incredible, as long as you liked what it was that he was doing. And if you didn't, well, get the fuck out. All right. <laughs> The next, we, the next kind of wave, both in the restaurant world and then eventually in the bar world, is you know, what we call the neo-fundamentalists, right? So these are people who, for whom, however, you know, much, much like people who, with reverence for old religious documents, these are people who, who thought whatever had been done in the past was inherently better than what we did now because all we'd done in the last 100, 150 years was screw things up. Um, and so you have on the, on the left-hand side, you have Mario Batali, right? So for 100 years, America's most popular cuisine had been this kind of broad, amorphous uh, kind of category called Italian. And Mario Vitale in the early 90s said, this is all wrong. There's no such thing as Italian food. There's only food from uh, Tuscany, and there's food from you know, Calabrese, and there's food from Piedmont, and we're going to make these specific regional cuisines, and we're going to make the risotto exactly how it was made in Lombardy, and if you don't like it, then you don't understand risotto. Right? And that was, again, very much, you know, because here, and we have exactly the same thing on the right-hand side, Sasha Petrosky, probably the Jonathan uh, Downey, well, actually the other way around. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so Sasha obviously brought back the idea of the, sort of the neo-speakeasy, really, uh, as sort of the, the person who really kind of brought that to life, I guess. And, you know, the, the idea, as Jacob says, that there are some fundamentals and there's some boundaries that cannot be crossed and, you know, that broadly anything created after 1935 is not worth drinking um, is, you know, largely down to that gentleman on the right-hand side. But you know, again, so what these, all, what all of these people do is they kind of they, they, they help build the fabric of the bar and restaurant culture and the context in which we're existing now. So they change things, they tweak the direction, and then we go in a different direction, which is you know again for both food and uh, drinks. The direction we've been in probably the last five years has been completely different again from the sorts of stuff that Jonathan and Sasha taught us. So on the left hand side we have David Chang, who's sort of the the high priest of what you call dude food. Um, so, and, and, and so where we'd had been like sort of super historical, all of a sudden we were making food that really had no historical context. Might have a little bit of Korean, a little bit of Japanese, but the important thing was that the flavors were turned up to 11. All right, so, you know, why make, uh, you know, why make a bowl of ramen that was traditional when you could f cram in all these extra ingredients and make it the most flavorsome bowl of ramen that anybody had ever made? Right? Why, you know, so suddenly things were being made with five, six, seven spices. How could you take the flavor that was traditional and conventional and amplify it? And we got to exactly the same point in drinks. And that's manifested itself in a couple of ways. So it's manifested itself in exactly, the, exactly what Jacob just said there, in five, six, seven, eight, nine ingredient drinks. So building, building flavor upon flavor upon flavor upon flavor. My best analogy sometimes, is I, I have two small children, and my best analogy sometimes for those types of drinks is like kids playing with paint. So you'll have seen kids playing with paint. They have this myriad of beautiful colors in front of them. They mix them all together and they get brown. And that's broadly <laughs> speaking. It's broadly speaking exactly what happens, right? So in so, the drinks. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. So the the other side of this coin is not necessarily millions and millions of ingredients, but um, picking out individual ingredients which are incredibly intense in flavor in their own right. So you don't necessarily have to be picking out eight or nine individual, very simple character flavors to then mix together. You know, the vast majority of the wonderful shiny bottles that we have and the, the glittering altars of spirits behind the bars that we now occupy uh, have an incredible range of flavor in them already. And we're now using even more and more intense spirits in small and, and larger and larger quantities in smaller and smaller drinks. So therefore concentrating flavor more and more and more to the point where almost it's almost imperceptible. So when you have a drink with say overproof rye, um, highly bitter and flavored Amaro, maybe some chartreuse and a couple of dashes of bitters in there, you've got probably 10,000 yeah, 10, flavor components all competing for your attention, and it gets incredibly, it, it's probably flavor dialed up to 12 rather than 11. <laughs> so, I mean, classic examples of those drinks, you know, the, the, the archetype that uh, Ian was talking about, and on the right, one of my favorite drinks, but it's the sort of drink you can only drink once, which is called a Trinidad Sour, and it's an ounce and a half of Angostura bitters. Right, and so it's like this kind of logical extension of if four, you know two dashes of Angus bitters taste amazing, so let's put in four. Hell, four tastes incredible, so let's you know keep putting in more, and then you know let's kind of see you know a bit like a jalapeno eating contest. Let's see what people can actually take, and it turns out to be delicious, but you can rarely only drink one, right? And that's true of a lot of these drinks, so they're very removed from what the guest actually likes to drink. 
Then the next bit is kind of, you know, punk food, if you like. So we've gone, you know, everyone's sick of highbrow. We want to make things as casual as possible. And you've seen this with the explosion of food trucks and casual dining and the elevation of chicken wings into a high art. Um, and on the, on the left-hand side, we have Roy Choi, who's, you know, a very, very celebrated uh, Korean uh, chef. Food Again, started his empire in food trucks based in Los Angeles, and it was kind of like, you know, screw all the rules for food. What we want to do is make flavorful food from the streets. It's more authentic than any of this kind of, you know, pretentious stuff. And we're seeing that in the bar world. So in the bar world, this is manifested with a gentleman on the right-hand side who is a representation of beer and shots. So this is kind of the almost the anti-cocktail movement. So to be a, a cool cocktail bar, sometimes you actually have to not be a cocktail bar. So be perfectly capable of making great cocktails, but actually have a great range of IPAs and a huge range of whiskeys that you can pair together uh, to sort of almost be like the anti-cocktail bar, essentially. Uh, another interesting example of the, the sort of the uh, punk chef kind of style stuff is a, a venue in London called Meat Liquor. Uh, which was a Michelin star chef who then took on the burger through via the medium of a food truck, then a pop-up, then his own restaurants. And so trying to elevate the burger um, to, to its highest possible standard. Does anybody know which bar the dude on the right works in, by the way? What's that? <laughs> it's a trick question. It's, you know, like homeless or hipster. It's like uh, <laughs> nine, 19th century gold digger or 21st century bartender. <laughs> All right. Um, a couple of things, what you'll see here, right, when we flick through all of these slides, you know, we've got my way or the highway, we've got the kind of the elevation of ingredients to almost, you know, um, sacrosanct levels, we've got like flavour that's almost, you know, can only be enjoyed in small doses, and then a kind of like fuck you to everything that we've just spent 15 years trying to create. Mm -hmm. And what do you have, you know, what's missing here, effectively, is the idea of, you know, what, what, do, what do our guests actually want to drink, right? What's the experience that they want to have when they come into our bars and restaurants? So there's been a lot of, and it's almost always men, right, both in restaurants and bars who are saying, here's what we're going to do, we're going to you know, throw away the previous script and this is what we're going to make and, you know, if you don't like it, well, you can lump it. And it's a very, very strange way of, uh, you know, of, of trying to explain yourself in the industry because where we think, if you like, the next spot to the, the, the trend will go will be in, in what we call, I guess, high-touch experiences for the guests. So trying to make your guests feel amazing when they come in. Um, and that should really be very much at the centerpiece of everything that it is that you're doing. Because once you put the guest at the center of your offering, right, it becomes very, very clear, well, so many things become clear, which will, and this sort of sets us up for, for everything we're gonna cover from now on. What is it that you're trying to do, right? It very, becomes very clear to the guests what, how they should feel when they walk in. It's very, very clear to the staff, the service standards that you expect them to adhere to. Um, it's very clear how many staff you should need and what level you need to train them to. Um, it tells you what sort of drinks, what sort of food um, should you offer. Um, but more importantly than anything else, when you put the guest experience at the heart of, of, of kind of your, your offering, um, you, you, you tap into a very, very kind of clear need from the guests themselves, which is to feel loved, to feel surprised, to feel like uh, you know, they belong in your bar. And then when you get into this spot, you get into a very kind of great uh, psychological state for them, which is basically a dopamine release. Right, and when you can get your guests, or you know, whichever industry, whether you're in retail or hotels or um, or anything else, you know, getting your guests to kind of have this massive hormonal release of pleasure is basically, at a primal level, what we're trying to do. And when you can when you can kind of unlock the little triggers that do that, um, there is suddenly no price that you can't charge, because every single drink that you offer will seem like great value. Right? There's no way in which they won't become regulars because they feel like they belong and they crave the pleasure that they get from returning to your bar and venue. So putting the guests at the very, very heart of the experience that you're offering solves your questions about guest recruitment and retention. It solves half your pricing problems and it gives you a very, very clear idea of how you should be training, training your staff. And it's very much at the heart of everything that we're trying to do from now on. All right, a couple of great examples. So this is, um, <clears throat> has anyone been to this bar before? Does anyone know who this gentleman is? He's a serial presenter at Tales of the Cocktail. This is uh, Agostino Peron from the Connaught Bar in London. Uh, it's probably my favorite bar room in the world, physical environment, it's gorgeous. Lots of green lacquer and, and beautiful things. And there is a huge amount of stuff to learn from the five-star hotel environment. We'll be talking about that a fair amount throughout this session because what these guys is really do is make people feel incredibly special. Um, now they do it on some, in a way which is almost intangible for many and unattainable for many people because they do it on a relatively limitless budget. However, to be honest, it's not really the physical trappings that makes these experiences special. It's the personal touches. 
Um, Agostino is probably one of the most engaging, personable, charming men you'll ever likely to meet. That's probably his greatest skill. His secondary skill is he's probably one of the most elegant and balletic bartenders you're ever likely to watch. So not only a pleasure to talk to, a pleasure to be around, he's actually a pleasure to sit in his company and just watch him work. Um, you see these people um, from time to time, and they're, they're few and far between in any industry, uh, much like uh, you know, great sports people, people who have this kind of almost indefinable touch, which you know, leaves people spellbound by what they do, and he's one of these people. Um, I couldn't possibly confidently look that stylish while shooting uh, <laughs> soda water into any vessel of any shape or size uh, from that distance, and yet he pulls it off remarkably well. Now, I'm sure this is probably take four, but that's not important. <laughs> Uh, I would say that if he was in the room as well. Um, but what, what these guys do is they, they turn everything into something extraordinarily special. So when you first walk through the door, you get handed a little, um, a very small, it's technically a shot glass, but it's, uh, it's almost more like a flute of whatever concoction they've chosen to give you as almost like an amuse-bouche when you walk through the door. Now, I know from working with them and from doing training with them in the past that you know it's not particularly expensive to produce. I'm not, I don't think I'm pulling back the wizard's curtain here in any kind of way, but you know, it's, it's something that they do which is, feels special because of the way they do it, the way they deliver it. The actual liquids inside are something that you and I could purchase and make no problem at all and probably give away free fairly easily if we really wanted to and write off the cost amongst the rest of the cocktails we sell. Uh, but just even that first impression when you walk through the door. Several of the cocktails come out um, on trolleys or they're actually served at tables so they have an opportunity to really interact with the people that are working uh, with the people that are creating the drinks that you have, and almost endle endlessly customizable, but in the most um, interesting ways. So they don't necessarily give you full control over the drinks that you're ordering. So it's not like walking into a diner in America and ordering breakfast. It's much more like you know, here is the here is what we have, and you know, how can we help you to make this into the absolute perfect drink for you, essentially. Is it, I mean, five star hotels are a great experience, right? Um, I don't know how many of you get a chance to spend much time and the hotel bar is very much a European thing. It doesn't exist in quite the same degree in the United States. But if you ever get the chance to go to London, the five star hotels there offer an experience which is almost be, you know, without parallel in, in the drinks business. Um, how many of you go, uh, is anybody here sort of buy cookbooks, have an addictive cookbook habit? A lot of bartenders do to prove to girls they take home that they can cook. Um, and uh, you know, a lot of people buy, so you buy your rudimentary cookbooks which teach you the skills. And then of course every Christmas, you know, out come the wave of top, bar ten, of top restaurant uh, cookbooks. And they're full of dishes which actually often aren't that complicated, putting aside the whole molecular kind of Ferran Adria and Histon Blumenthal. But oftentimes the, drink, the recipes aren't that complicated. But you go to all this effort, you make everything, and then you're like, is that it? Right? Because you're not offering the same experience. You, can't, you can never bring those things to life because there's a whole lot of things which have nothing to do with the ingredients and everything to do with the context which really make those dishes in a top restaurant taste amazing and likewise the top drink. Let's quickly just, again, returning to um, kind of your napkins, take a few minutes just to think about a truly amazing experience you had. It doesn't have to be in the hospitality world. It helps. Chances are over the last couple of days it probably wasn't with an airline. Um, but, <laughs> Um, an experience as a guest that really made you feel particularly special, um, and then how might you try and replicate those lessons to bring that to life in your own venues? Let's start with one question. So think of that, think of that experience and write it down very quickly. Think of the place it was in and rough bones of what it was. Right. When you kind of put, I guess, you know, we're going to return to this theme again and again and again, particularly when we get to pricing and how to, how to tweak your, and even engineer your menus to, to create, uh, you know, to basically increase your, your spend per guest without your guest ever noticing that you did. Um, and the very, very simple way to do that, which is to stop thinking about price altogether um, and start to think about what's the experience at which point nobody is ever going to think that this, even, you know, the, no, not even, nobody's even going to notice the cost. Right, so a couple of great examples of this are to, so basically you've got to stop thinking about price and start thinking about value. So how can you create an experience which makes the guests say to themselves, that was absolutely incredible, I can't even put a price on that. In which case you can charge up to a point almost anything you like. Right, so a great example of this, this is a bar in Sydney, Australia called Eau de V. And they have a large uh, gay and female clientele. Um, who, who love the cosmopolitan. But of course, this is a bar also full of very, very serious young male bartenders who don't love the cosmopolitan. And so... Um, Such as Greg Sanderson, who's in the room. Oh, Greg Sanderson, do we have Greg here? Greetings, Greg. Cool, so this is one of the best bars in the world, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> no. 
That was actually in my notes. All right, so <laughs> you've got this... Um, what, the, what O to V did, and we're going to return, we've got a couple of examples from them, because they did something very, very unique. Um, Australia is a phenomenally expensive country for cocktails in the first place, thanks to cripplingly high taxation, and also Sydney is just one of the most expensive cities on the planet. Um, and O to V decided that they wanted to be even more expensive than the already expensive norm. So the way that they had to do that was that every single one of their signature cocktails had to come and be served in an experience that no other bar could replicate. So that what happened was they, so instead of walking in, you're saying 22 Australian dollars, which is basically 22 US for a martini or a cosmopolitan, what the hell, right? Instead, they served it in a way that, that you had no parallel for, right? So how many other bars, does anybody else serve the cosmopolitans in a 1920s German ladies leg shaker? <laughs> No, I can't, I'm amazed that it hasn't popped up at Cocktail Kingdom, actually. Um, <laughs> I mean, this is, I think, um, how, Greg, how many of these, this, this is the only one you know of, right? Came from West Virginia? No, no, they've had a couple. You've had a couple of ladies' legs? What's that? They're broken? We have, we have three in the country, and I think one's broken, one's in Melbourne, and one's had one Yeah. So what this did, I mean, it took a fairly prosaic drink, right? The Cosmopolitan, which every bar had first elevated and then and then started to make very generic, and then eventually their staff had started to curse. And all of a sudden, it turned the Cosmopolitan into a truly phenomenal experience. Um, and they also had, for a while, I'm not sure if this is still true, but it was only for women. Right? Is that still how it runs? Yeah. Right, which is a very, very clever trick again, which is you know, a bit like the, the fabled secret menu of places like Chipotle. This is an experience that only a small number of people can get, and you have to be in the know, and you have to be part of a small subset of guests to be able to do this. And in that sense, you know, the subset was incredibly large, 50% of the guests, but it immediately made it feel special, right? So you'd see large groups of women, hens parties coming in who are, you know, the, the guests we probably like least, and all of a sudden you've turned them into very, very high value guests because they're fascinated. They think, oh my God, this special experience, only women can buy the special ladies league cosmopolitan. You can only get it here at O to V. And all of a sudden you totally flip the, the, the way in which people understand the pricing and turn that into exceptional value. But you never thought you'd be compared to Chipotle when you arrived, Greg. <laughs> you know, it's the idea of, and, and, you know, hotels and restaurants and even airlines do this, about, you know, special releases, small things that only a small subset of their guests or their target audience can get their hands on. Another great example as well of, you know, how to stop people thinking about pricing. This, as you probably know, is, is Pegu Club, which opened in 2005 um, by Audrey Saunders. And in the early 2000s in New York, the way you got a martini, uh, well, typically it was vodka, sometimes gin, but almost universally it came in your Morton Steakhouse 10 ounce glass, right? Incredibly large. Now, Audrey wanted to, you know, was very much a classicist and she wanted to get people back to the original size. But if she'd gone straight from the 10 ounce that everybody understood and then down to a four and a half ounce, she would have alienated a lot of guests. Instead, she built a very, very loyal clientele around her signature drink by doing this great little thing she called a dividend, right? Which is a little sidecar glass. So it's effectively the size of two, marti two martinis, right? So she took the 10 ounce and over time they've slowly you know, dropped the, the sizing. But initially it was basically 10 ounces of martini. So five in the little glass and the other in the little sidecar. So that guests and said it and, you know, and charged the proper price. She made it expensive. Um, and what she did there was effectively took something which you know, people could have been very upset about. Why am I not getting the martini like I know and like? You know, I've got the ability to pay for it suddenly turned it into a great experience and built a very loyal clientele through that. There's one other interesting example of that, and that's actually the Merchant Hotel in Belfast a few years ago, where they changed to using three-ounce coupette glasses to serve their martinis in. And for those who've ever visited Belfast before, the idea of paying um, anything over probably three pounds for a three-ounce three ounce anything is pretty alien. Um, the point that the then bartender, Jack McGarry, made to me was um, people in Belfast would rather pay for a glass that's completely full than they would for a glass that appears half empty. So we have a five ounce coupette, it appears half empty, whereas we have a completely full three ounce, they're much more likely to pay for it. We're gonna talk a lot about you know, the, the little triggers you can do to make your experience seem like great value, and much more than you're ever worrying about like the rudiments. But the, first, let's have a drink. The, of course, so the, the, the drink you have in front of you and I've probably finished already. <laughs> <laughs> well, well done us on our timing. Uh, what's with the um, milliliters, guys? I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> Way to know your audience. <laughs> That's true. Fundamental piece of presentation, know your audience. So milliliters is a system used by all countries of the world except for the USA and Burma. Um, <laughs> and, 
as a fairly, uh, anyway, 45 mils is roughly equivalent to one and a half ounces. The old Cuban is a classic drink. One of the other great things as well is, is have a signature drink and stick to it because one of the other ways to continually deliver on guest experience is for them to, to have a drink which they associate with your bar and that actually drives, you know, makes them become regulars. Your bartenders will always want to change the menu all the time, right? Let's get rid of these old drinks. I'm sick of making it. I've got a brand new drink with amaro and chartreuse and rye. But when you get a drink that you know is hitting it out of the park and has become your signature, stick to it, right? And at the Pegu Club, together with the martini with the dividend, it's this amazing drink here, which is the old Cuban. So anybody still got some old Cuban? If so, cheers. Mm. Cheers. Very, very simple drink, right? So Audrey um, worked at her bar and, and throughout her whole career has been almost the equivalent of the, the three-star Michelin French chef. So she's just going through a process of refinement, refinement, refinement. Even this drink here was a year and a half in its creation. And you look at it and you're like, it's kind of like a mojito sour with dark rum. How could it possibly have taken that long? But, you know, tweaking, trying it with lots and lots of different rums, trying it with different champagne. You know, what were the right ratios? What was the best way to serve it? Should it have been on the rocks? You know, it predated the mojito craze in the US as well, but it kind of really, she took that, you know, the daiquiri and the mojito, added champagne, put it with a rum, Bacardi 8, which had just been launched, and, and turned it into probably, together with the penicillin, the, the modern classic of the 21st century so far. And it's been still on the menu at every single one of her bars has never left. So that when you go into that bar, whether you've been away for three months or three years, you know you can get an old Cuban, you know it's going to be amazing, and that gives you kind of the same rush of pleasure for the guest experience that we're going to talk about a little further. Cool. Well, you're going to just fill in for Sean Muldoon, who's going to be here. <laughs> I'm the Neymar. Um, so this is the Dead Rabbits. Has anyone been to the Dead Rabbits? A show of hands? Lucky you. It's an amazing place. I'm very lucky to have... Um, oh, sorry. No, sorry, sorry. I'm very lucky to have met these guys um, a, some considerable amount of time ago when they were really kind of getting started in the, in the cocktail business. And the interesting thing and fascinating thing about Sean, and it's a real shame he can't be with us to talk about it today, is about vision. And we talked about vision earlier, and um, Sean is probably one of the best examples I know of, of apart from the people we're going to talk to obviously later on, of, uh, of vision in the cocktail industry. And he's a great example of somebody who had a, a vision that was much, much broader than his own individual business. So if you um, were working in Belfast in 2004, 2005 in a cocktail bar, chances are you didn't have a great deal of hope of being the most famous cocktail bar in the world. That's nothing against Belfast. It's a wonderful, wonderful town. If you ever get a chance to go there and have, have a drink, there's some amazingly hospitable people and, and some great times to be had. What Sean Muldoon had was a bit of a vision, and he had a vision which was, you know, I need to elevate the cocktail culture of my city in order to elevate the cocktail culture of my bar in order to make my bar the most famous cocktail bar in the world. So it's a very broad vision, right? So you, you know, you're starting broad and you're kind of narrowing down to where you can actually control things. So he was um, the, manager, the, the manager of a bar uh, called the Merchant Hotel Bar in Belfast. And what they did there was they set about elevating every single element that they possibly could of their program from start to finish. They really went about making themselves famous. They, they started a thing called the Connoisseurs Club, which is something where they uh, basically got people from all around the world, persuaded them to come to Belfast to talk about what they do and how they do it for a living, and invited people from all around the world to come and listen. Um, they became so well known and so famous, they won uh, five, four? How many Spirited Awards did they win? Um, all Three. of them. Yeah. They, won, they won most of the Spirited Awards, at least one year in a row, um, and became steadily more and more famous to the point where um, they now, having at one point worked in a city which is almost completely unknown on the cocktail map, um, built one of the most successful hotel bars in the world. Uh, for a two or three year period, won numerous spirited awards here at Tales of the Cocktail, um, were then approached to open a cocktail bar in New York, which they've since made into the most, one of the most famous cocktail bars to open in the last five years. Um, who, so who here, just quickly to give you some kind of Belfast content, who, who comes from a small market and feels like, you know, it's always tough for me to get on the map and uh, very, very difficult? Singapore is a small market? <laughs> All right. <laughs> that's true, that's true. All right. Yeah, that's true, right? But what it does definitely give you is um, this ability, like, like Ian said, this ability, you know, a much bigger mission statement. So, you know, sometimes we talk to a lot of bartenders and they come from a tiny place and, you know, I, nobody comes from a smaller place than me, I'd probably rest assured. I come from a hamlet of 400 people, with, uh, which is where you'll find New Zealand's oldest pub. Um, but anyway, you know, to very, very small markets, you can actually fire the people up and your staff up because you have a much, much bigger idea, a bigger vision about what it is you're trying to do. We are building cocktail culture here. We're going to build it in this bar with all the work that you do day by day. Cool. So Belfast, you know, is the sort of place where you'd say to yourself, 
you know, it's, it's fairly grim. It's had a lot of trouble. The thing you probably say to yourself when you go there is winter is coming, right? There's a reason. <laughs> there's a reason. It's the it's the place where they shot Game of Thrones, um, and it didn't. Re you know, and then all of a sudden they created this absolutely extraordinary experience, an amazing bar, recreated it, and launched Belfast and Sean on the global stage. Dead rabbit. Or Okay, so if Sean couldn't be here, what we were going to do, we've got three of our favourite operators from around the world, um, and now today, through a process of magic, we've made it two. Um, so very, very quickly, the first, uh, I'm going to get two of these guys up, Brian, I might get you to come up as well. Um, just to give you some quick bio, so Sean, who couldn't be here, um, Zidanek Kastanek, who's an award-winning bartender, um, and, and much like kind of your, your classic global bartender these days, has, has worked all over the world. He's worked in Sydney, London, uh, now heading up in Singapore, 28 Hong Kong Street, which is a bar much like, I guess, the Merchant Hotel did in Belfast. It's put Singapore on the map globally uh, for cocktail culture. Um, and he's also regularly called on to go and train, you know, setting up, we made a joke about Burma, but he was just there last week, uh, you know, establishing cocktail culture in a place that has no context of it, or certainly where there's been no cocktail served for 60 years. And then the other side, we have Ryan Chetty Awadner, who's um, probably, so Sean had a very clear vision and an idea. This is what we're going to do, and I'm going to stick to this idea for a decade. Um, Ryan changes his ideas every three months, um, and every single one of them is the best idea on the planet. Um, so probably the most innovative operator that I think we've ever come across in terms of reinventing his vision. Um, so most recently, he opened a bar called White Lion. Um, which we'll, I'll, I'll get these guys to talk about. But we've got two great young operators, the next generation of, of top bar managers and owners with us now. So, cool. All right, so we're going to go through and do a little housekeeping here. Okay. So if you can, please tell everyone a little bit about 28 Hong Kong Street. I'm sure that they'd love to hear all about it. Uh, well, it's a, as it says, it's in Singapore. Uh, it's not in China. It's a tiny little island next to uh, Malaysia and Indonesia. Uh, it's like an hour and 20 minutes flight from Thailand, just for you guys to put it on a map. Uh, it's 65-seater. Uh, we have a, a fair bit of uh, whiskey and brown spirits and rums on, on a big bar. But as we were talking about a vision and mission, I think that uh, when N28 was, was opening and when it was also uh, all establishing and Michael Callahan was the opening barman who is actually coming from your country guys here from San Francisco. The whole idea was just to uh, create a good fun cocktail bar uh, in a city which doesn't really have any proper cocktail bars as we know them without forcing the cocktails down the throat to every single guest and customer. So it was, the whole idea was to kind of open a bar in a, in a city which doesn't have any real bars without shouting out and saying, here we are, we're bringing the new culture here, you guys haven't seen this, we are the best, you should come and, and, and drink with us. It was, it was kind of the other way around. We've hired a PR company to take us out of every single press and magazine possibly for first three months so no one knew about us and we can really kind of spread the word, word of mouth and bring the people in who we kind of, who liked us for the reason that they wanted to try something new. They wanted to uh, drink what they already knew from New York or London, because there's a huge expat uh, community in Singapore. But it was all based on, here we are, come in, we like drinks. If you like drinks, you will probably like us. Tell us a little bit about what the inside is like, the actual physical structure, and you know what a guest can experience when they walk in the door. Uh, it's very, very simple. Uh, I didn't want to distract anyone from the actual main point, which is the cocktail. Uh, just f for you to have an idea, it's a 65-seater. We have two stations, and we serve on average 360 drinks a night, uh, which it's cocktails. 96% is cocktails. We go through maybe 15, 20 beers a night. And uh, I think that the record was one and a half bottle of wine in one night. Uh, everything else is a cocktail. So it was, it was, the whole room is very narrow. Uh, we have three different types of seating because uh, we wanted to accommodate everyone. So we have booths for big, bigger parties. We have uh, lower seating uh, and the normal tables for if someone wants to have a food, as a food is a big part of thing what we do over there. We have a higher seaters for the people who kind of like to either stand or have like one leg on, on stool and then one, one elbow on a bar. So kind of you can pick and choose from every single type of seating. 
uh, they're possible, or the most common ones. And uh, we kind of really try to pay attention into real details. So uh, we hand built our uh, uh, sound system so we can really crank up music and have a little party at two o'clock, three o'clock in the morning because we opened that late without you guys have to shout at each other ears. Uh, so we spend a fair bit of time and a fair bit of resources on building good sound system. Uh, the menu is very, really broken down into really, really small uh, groups and it's very easy to read rather than putting there loads of different data and dates and details. We just launched a new menu and I, I'm fairly known for using emoticons in, in, in messages. So my team took a piss out of me and named one of the cocktails by emoticons. So that doesn't actually real has any name. So people when ordering the drink, they kind of do the dance lady and like closing eyes monkey and and they having fun with it and no one really understands it doesn't have a name. Everyone now someone called it WhatsApp, someone called it dancing lady. Uh, as, as I say, it doesn't really have to make sense as long as the people are having fun with it, and that's like the whole core of the menu. Uh, that would be it, I guess, uh, about how that place feels and looks and what we're trying to achieve there. Perfect. We're going to play a little ping pong here. So, Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> so, Ryan has uh, four award winning bars. Um, well, three are, well, two are open, one is pending. Okay. Uh, I've been involved in four bars of late that have thankfully all been well received, but no, three on the, right. three on the horizon. And so you, it's, uh, it's fair to say that each of these venues is wildly different from one another? Yeah, I think so. I mean, um, when I was working under, as, well, as a kind of creative manager for groups, um, for other owners, it was always important to me to, to work within their vision but create something that was very unique. Um, I'm, I suppose I've got a little bit of a short attention span in terms of that, where I jump across different ideas. But to me, they've always got to be quite complete. They've got to sum up their own identity and bring something. You know, I've always had a focus on innovation. That's always where my direction and interests have always lied. So trying to push those kind of, not themes, but those concepts in a way that creates something quite unique, but is, is very distinct within each of the categories. Um, I want to talk a little bit about, about White Lion. Sure. So can you tell me where it is, yep. uh, what it is, and why it's so unique? Um, so. White Lion is a small little bar in deepest, darkest East London. Um, so it's, it's kind of in the ghetto of East London, actually. It's kind of in the area where there's, it's, it's very close by to where a lot of the other bars are. Um, so we've got some amazing neighbors, some fantastic bars. Some of my favorite bars in, in London, in fact, are, are, are in East London. Um, it's kind of the Brooklyn of, of London. It's the area where there was a lot of innovation, a lot of people trying to set out and do their own thing. Um, and we opened nine months ago, and I think people have often written about what White Lion isn't rather than what it is. Um, so on the kind of top line, I suppose, of, of what the bar doesn't have is, is probably the, the kind of tagline of what people kind of talk to other people about the bar about. So the bar has none of the things that you usually find in a high-end cocktail bar. So there's no ice, and there's no citrus, there's no perishables. So no fresh fruits, none of the things that you could have in, in the final Cuban we enjoyed earlier. Um, but I suppose, actually, that was the that's the bit that kind of got translated to people. It wasn't actually the, the purpose behind the bar. The bar was about, from a kind of innovation point of view, it was trying to do something different. It was trying to show to, you know, well, for ourselves, to prove ourselves, and also to our friends, that you know, there were other ways of creating drinks. Um, so it wasn't about sacrificing the best bits of a bar. Uh, it was about how to look at things differently. But the actual, for me, what I wanted to do in kind of creating the bar and, and uh, bringing my team together was, focus on the things that I really loved about being a bartender, and that was looking after people. So it's, it's a kind of turnaround in terms of the way the bar is put together. So we serve drinks quick, um, we have a lot of time to talk to people, uh, and the whole point about the bar was to create a cocktail bar for people who don't go to cocktail bars. Um, it is a house drinks only menu, so that probably doesn't seem the case when you kind of walk in and greeted with it, but it's very much designed in a way that we can, we can look after people and make sure they're having a good time. So my question, and I'm sure most everyone else's question in here, since most of them probably haven't been here, has anyone been to White Lion? Okay, so for the majority <laughs> of the rest of us, what are these cocktails then that you're serving if there's no ice? Um, I think a lot of people were worried it was going to be your bartender drinks are very kind of boozy, brown, stirred drinks in that vein. Um, it, was, it was quite amazing for us just before, probably prior to us opening, and in fact talking about the concept. Dave Arnold did a, a series of tests where he Pepsi challenged drinks that had been made a la minute uh, to drinks that had been made in advance, and he showed that there was no difference between them. So it was quite nice to have that kind of justification. 
Um, but it's we, we serve a full range of drinks. You know, it's um, as I say, everything is done under our control. So I think one of the th other things that people kind of noticed that was it was all it's all our own brand stuff. So it's all our own spirits. We still work with wonderful spirits such as we you know at the moment we have um, Jewers and Saint Germain in the bar. We, we we work with other brands, but it's it's done in a very kind of specific manner. So we try and control every aspect of the drink. Still have a, a full range. So if you come in and you're a you know, somebody who wants to come and party and have a beer, we, we serve beer. Um, we try and make it playful for them as well. So we, we, add, we serve the same beer two ways. We add a hot distillate if you want it more of a pale ale style, um, or it's just a session of lager. Um, and then our drinks range from, we built a carbonation system, so we have light fizzy drinks. Uh, we use lots of different acids. You know, we can, we can still have sour, fresh, zesty, cold um, serves without needing ice or citrus or anything like that. Um, all the way through to a menu that covers big boozy serves and, and everything in between, I hope. So this sounds pretty efficient <coughs> to me. Yeah. You're putting um, drinks out pretty quickly. We get drinks out very quickly. It's efficient in a couple of senses as well. We have very little waste. Um, actually, The Guardian were really kind to write an article on us because we, we think we've reduced waste by about 70%. So our costs are saved, so we pass that on to the consumer as well. So drinks come quick. They don't, you know, we took away a lot of the barriers that people find. So our friends coming to a cocktail bar who go, takes 20 minutes to get a drink and it costs me 20 bucks. Um, our drinks are cheaper. We still think they're good value, but it's, um, you know, it's, they come quick and they don't have that same barrier to price. But yeah, we can serve quickly so we can make sure that we're looking after people. We find out what they want to be drinking while they, rather than what they feel they should be drinking. Thank you. All right, we're going back to you, Zed. Um, it's talk interesting to listen to that. <laughs> <laughs> so you were mentioning earlier uh, about when you came and 28 Hong Kong Street came to Singapore, there were not many other cocktail bars. So talk to me about the culture, the, the cocktail culture in Southeast Asia, because I know that you've been working more than just in Singapore itself. I mean, it's, a, it's, it's just one of those things when uh, five years ago, it was really uh, London, New York, Sydney, Melbourne. There was like this, this big name cities and then kind of Berlin started coming up and then Paris and, and, and et cetera. And as it, I think that normal evolvement in anything that, you know, as soon as you reach certain number, it kind of booms and spreads very quickly. So the evolvement in our bartending scene in last five years uh, was that there was a certain bar opening or certain cities opening up. In last two years, there's a huge amount of cities around there. So we now have bars, as I said, I just came from Burma, a place which doesn't have a McDonald's and 7-Eleven. Uh, we opened a uh, Japanese Yakatori Den Bar and uh, Italian place. Uh, and people tend to go and love them and, and drink. And but as I said, they don't really have any essentials as, as we know. Uh, five years ago, there was a couple of bars in Prague. Uh, and now there's 15 really good bars, which I think that they can stand out to the very, very good standard. Uh, when I moved to Singapore, there was very few bars. One of them is the Jigger and Pony just opened, uh, which is beautiful, beautiful, beautiful place and makes great drinks. There's a Cuffling Club, uh, there was 28, and there was maybe one or two uh, other places. But mainly the, 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 the thing there was that what you are actually uh, facing is that A, you don't have a customer who is used to drink cocktails, so you kind of have to educate them. Uh, but B, uh, and it was the biggest trouble what's in Asia, in, in my eyes, and I spent six months in, in India training all of the five-star hotels, Tashis and Obrois and ITCs and Marriott's and etc. And every single Asian country I spent some time at and worked at and open places, the biggest issue is your staff. Uh, not that you don't have a guest who know how to drink, you don't have a staff how to make drinks, uh, and if you do have a staff who kind of know a little bit about cocktails, they don't have the understanding of that. It's not like the mentioning cookbook, that if you just get a recipe uh, and you follow it, that means that you're going to make a good drink. Uh, is way more to it, and then the whole training kind of takes time. What Singapore facing is that for decades now, they don't really have any uh, unemployment. Uh, it's like 2%, which pretty much means people who cannot work rather than they don't want to work. So one big trouble which you're facing that if, you know, and me coming from London, as uh, I worked there for four years, uh, you were holding on to your good bar uh, job because, you know, there's another 20 people waiting for you to fail so they can jump on and then and, and having your career. Uh, in Singapore, it doesn't work that way. You, you raise your voice on your, on, your, on your colleagues or on your, on your staff and 
you can be pretty much sure that if they are not there long enough and they don't know what your mission and vision, uh, they just turn around and leave because they know they can pick up a phone call, uh, pick up a call, and uh, pick up a phone and have another five jobs next day. So uh, you're facing all of those troubles. But that said, uh, Asians are really great in a way that they uh, kind of doesn't have the ego of big travelers and they know everything. They're really open to new things and they kind of sit down in front of you and say, I have no clue what you just mixed for me, but I love it and I want it again kind of thing. And uh, what really works with them is that we do in 28 little details that we write a little cards for them. Uh, whenever they like cocktails without telling them, he would write that a recipe for them for like imprinted cards with a little envelope. As they're leaving the bar, they would get that with the bill. So they remember what that cocktail was and they can make it at home because there are instructions how to make it or they can bring it back next next time when they are there and they can just show it to us. And that's how we keep all drinks from the menus and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, that definitely brings me to my next question. When, when we talk about in, in a place where the cocktail culture is almost non-existent, you know, they have no reference to draw from and they have no preconceived notions about what they think that they like. Um, and, and that obviously is an example of how you would kind of manage their expectations? Is there anything else that you're doing? Or when you built the cocktail menu, you had the idea in your head that, yes, I know the cocktail culture is non-existent. So was it we can do anything, or we want to be kind of baseline and build from there? Or how, how did that evolution process work for you? I, I think that's a, that's a great example is that Ryan's Bar is uh, basically they went out there and they had dream and they wanted to do something. And you can do that in, in London, and you can do it pretty much anywhere. But in, in, in London, it's a great thing that I always said that if whatever idea, a mad idea you open in London, you always find 200 people to follow you, to kind of fill up your door and just like go with you and, and, and have a great laugh with that. Uh, when you building up any bar, I think that you need to have the clear vision and you need to stick with it. So I think that a really uh, important bit is that even that you see bars like White Lion or hotel bars doing a trolley service, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Even though it's really good and you would love to do it, I think that it's a very, very important to go back, sit down, and go through your first drawings of the first menus and first ideas of what your bar is about, and kind of match it if if it's something what fits your venue. Even though that you love working with liquid nitrogen, is it really good idea to do it in your bar? Is it really you? Is it authentic? to your concept. If you find that, that it's authentic, then go for it. If you find that it's not authentic, it's not you, then it's better to forget it or use it in a way that you can kind of fit it fit, fit it within your theme. So um, I definitely would just want to keep talking about your experience in Southeast Asia. I know that you've taken the successes that you've had at 28 Hong Kong Street and kind of broadened it a little bit and you've been doing some other consulting concepts. So talk to me a little bit about what else you've been doing and kind of how you are working with, you mentioned staff has been an issue as well. What else does it look like around Southeast Asia? Uh, I mean, Bali is one of the great places which is really booming. There's an a absolute legend in our industry. I think that half of this room will know his name called Dre Maso. Uh, it's, it's a gentleman who has been in industry for 20 years and, then, and he just left the big pie of London and then moved to Indonesia and started opening places over there and doing from beach clubs to beautiful little bars and recently he just moved to Singapore and working with places there too. Uh, what I would, I would say is that, uh, uh, as I said, it's everything, everything boomed out and everything kind of opened. There's no really any barriers that you cannot think of that you can open. I think that you know, if you would want to open something like White Lion in Singapore or Bangkok, you would definitely have a chance to get your followers these days. Because with Instagram and Facebook and Twitter and all of the Facebook, we all have information about anything and everything. Even the guests these days are learning more about what's happening around the world and they would follow what, what would you're trying to do. One of the great example in what we just did in one little restaurant uh, is a place called Burnt Ends. Uh, and they have 23 seats. Uh, they really only about food. They don't even make coffee because they, the owner believed that he couldn't find a good barista or good enough for him to serve the best quality coffee. So they said, we, we rather would not do 
uh, coffee at all if we know that we not, would serve it in a top quality. And we spent four months of trying to create some sort of concept for them to make a cocktails or kind of get around the idea of serving some sort of mixed drinks. And we actually ending up with the good old barrel aging kind of thing. But uh, we talk, we talking to lots of international bartenders, and they coming in and then giving us their recipes, and we tweaking them and playing around with them. But the idea now is that the, all of the drinks are efficient, balanced. They all taste exactly the same. So even you don't have a bartender, any any server can go and pour two ounces on a rocks, zested with orange, lemon, or grapefruit. It's the three different garnishing and service a beautiful cocktail which makes sense and was lots of thoughts put into it if really efficient quick time which I think that White Lion would share the same sort of type of idea that it's easy to do and it, it was all pre-done all of the work was done before so now for the guests it's just very comfortable to order they don't have to wait they know exactly what they're getting and they, they're getting it all the time same thank you all right Ryan we're back to you so back to White Lion. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about it, the growing process with it or some of the challenges that you've faced with not only just necessarily the consumer, but also the people that you work with. Um, so actually, yeah, touching on the industry side, I think to begin with, I think a lot of people saw it as a bit of a fuck you to the industry. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it wasn't intended like that at all. You know, this was, it was actually born out of a lot of love for it. You know, I, I love, I've loved all the venues I've worked with and I, you know, Ian, you, know, you talked about being a huge influence on the Edinburgh scene. That was very much on me as well. And all the people I've worked with have been, you know, I've, I've taken all of that on and it's kind of been, excuse the pun, distilled into in what I've done in White Lion. Um, but it was, you know, it, it was, I think, because it kind of bucked a lot of what was established. And, you know, the idea was to stimulate a discussion and say, you know, this isn't the only way of putting together drinks. Um, but definitely before we opened the bar, uh, there was a little bit of... Uh, a little, uh, you know, there was rumors around and kind of a, a few murmurings around uh, what we were doing and, and the motivations behind it. And you know, I think a lot of people didn't even think there was going to be a physical bar. Like, I think it's still the case that people can't really picture the way the bar operates right. when they come in because ultimately, when you come in, it's kind of like a sleazy little East End bar that's that's fun to be in that you get good drinks in. Uh, it's it's not about the you know it, it wasn't about creating a temple of a cocktail to us. It was about creating a very special place that celebrated the best parts of a cocktail bar, but in a way that was more approachable to people. Um, but we certainly faced challenges in that regard from the kind of industry side, because I don't think people could quite picture what it was gonna be. Um, and as I say, it's still the case until people actually make it through. But from the consumer side, um, we thought there was gonna be more of a necessity to really kind of explain everything yeah. as we went through. Um, thankfully, we, we had a lot of press when we opened up. People were um, very keen to write about what we were doing, because it was quite different. Uh, so a lot of, the media translated our message across, which was helpful. Uh, people were definitely coming in. It was a it was a destination as a bar, so people knew they were coming in to try and have something different. You know, there was a different experience coming to this bar for sure because people didn't know quite what to expect. They knew what they couldn't get. Uh, they weren't quite sure what they could get. Um, but it was again, it was still you know there was a, and there is still part of our conversation is is kind of talking to our guests about this idea. You know, we we talked the, the exercise at the beginning of the the, the seminar was what mission statement was and my mission statement across what we do as a company is getting people to drink better um, and that's not well that's the overarching motivation behind what I want to achieve mm -hmm. so by having a bar that's you know focused on innovation does things very differently hopefully we're getting people you know there's there isn't the fallback of, of products that come in an order it forces them to kind of force is probably a bit of a strong word but we encourage a kind of conversation around it so instead of going right well I don't understand these drinks. I have to order a drinks menu. I can't order a gin and tonic, but we can. Ha we have the time to go up to chat and say, "Well, what do you? What would you have wanted that gin and tonic to do for you?" Yeah. Um, and so we can, without kind of boring people. And you know, it was actually one of the nicest things that somebody came up to the bar and said is, "You can choose your level of interaction in this bar. You know, if you want to get a tasty drink, you can get it in around 10 seconds, and um, you can go sit down and enjoy it with your friends, or we will talk you through the process of how we remineralize our water, make our spirits." do all the cordials, everything right through to the final product. Uh, and you know, we can get very geeky on it, but ultimately we're just trying to encourage people to look at their drink in a different way. I think, uh, just to add on to it, I think that the most important message in, in, in what just Ryan said is that, and I, be, I hugely believe that that should be a massive part of any bar you open, it's al always make sure that your guest is feeling, feeling comfortable. And in my head, I can't 
picture any bar in the world and even if it's white lion who they do crazy things they don't use citrus anything perishable etc etc if you make that guest feel straight away that they're coming into something what's totally uh, new and they're not used to and they've never experienced they will be nervous and they will not definitely feel comfortable as Ryan said that it, it is very innovative bar but it is just a neighborhood yeah. bar in a in a in a in a East London and if your guest will walk into that bar with that on mind they will very very well receive anything you want to tell them about your crazy ideas what you make 28 is the same thing we spend three hours uh, prepare the bar before we open every single day because most of our stuff is homemade, fortified and done to done to the order and loads of stuff is prepared with the kitchen and in our laboratory but we don't force that to our guests and we don't we don't tell that on a menu and we don't show our lab to anyone it's hidden in the corner so for everyone who just walks in it's a very fast fun drinks in a very simple glass but if they ask you are able to explain them what you actually do and why it tastes different or better or etc cetera, etc cetera. so the important message here is always to no matter what you run and what you do with your concept uh it's very important to get the guests to ask themselves i guess before you throwing it at them all of the informations which they may be not even interested that in. they just wanted to have a quiet drink thank you um because I love the two of your minds so much, I want to get a little bit more kind of personal and just to understand, you know, where you come <laughs> from in, in your thought process and, sure. and, and like why are you in the business and what is your personal mission statement, your goal? Um, yeah, so I think mine is very much to get people to drink better. I mean, it's, it is throughout everything, all the writing work I do, all, all the trainings, a lot of the stuff, you know, as I say, a lot of my, my focus has been on innovation but that, to me, is not about creating things that are alien to people. I, you know, what I hopefully do is, is, is get people excited about stuff. It's, it's innovation that's relevant, hopefully, to the, to the average consumer. So even you know, giving people, training people on little things that they can do at home, so by the time they come to the bar, they're more excited to try something different. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it seems that way. Can, can everyone hear Ryan? Will you oh, pull, yeah, pull a little closer to you? I was kind of talking. Can you hear me better now? Have you missed everything I've said before? <laughs> Maybe, uh, right now. <laughs> Maybe right now. Maybe right now. So, yeah, that, that focus on innovation is, is, it also translates into that idea of getting people to, to drink better. Zed, tell me the same thing. Tell me, about uh, your, brain. Tell me your brain. No, I think it's a little bit more selfish for me. Uh, I, I really enjoy what I'm doing. Uh, I can't really imagine to be doing anything else. Uh, my, the way how I came about this, this business was that my dad was in it for a long time. He was a maitre of a small, tiny uh, hotel in a ski resort. And uh, so I started as a chef apprentice when I was 14 and then kind of worked my way up uh, through the whole hotel as a receptionist, cleaner, housekeeper, bellboy, uh, anything kind of you can imagine. And uh, I'm a huge believer in uh, if you want to do good in this uh, industry, you need to know all of those aspects uh, of the business. But that was said many, many times. So I was kind of thinking about what, what, what's really in that for me when I saw that uh, question yesterday. And I, I think that uh, if you want to be successful barman or metody or owner of any operation, I think that you first of all need to be a good person uh, in a way how you, you know, you can't host people well if you don't mean it. If you're in it for money or any other reason, uh, that you want to get famous or you want to be right up about or you want to be just winning competitions or awards i think that's this honest kind of way how to be in that business so what's my biggest motivator is that i believe that if we open more venue and we have more people having fun and you know we, we opened up this luxury of food and drinks to more people that kind of makes me feel that we're doing very honorable kind of fun job to people and host them. So for me, it's really about just to try to be as best person as I can and, and kind of the way how I reward myself is to see that people, they like what we do. Um, and I have one more question for you. So when you talk about that and self-motivation and, and getting your mission out and, and how you uh, feel when you're creating a program, how do you motivate the staff that you work with specifically because you're in an area like you'd mentioned before, people don't necessarily, your, your staff, have a lot of background information about what they're doing? How do you keep them motivated to want to adhere to your vision? 
for the particular environment that you're in? Uh, one of my, three of my partners, they all business, uh, they have all business background. So even though I've been in this industry for 14 years, I actually never had a review. Uh, like you sit, sit down after six months with your staff or your bar manager back in the day would sit down with me and talk to me about if I done well or I haven't done well. It, kind of non-existent in Czech Republic, in London, in Australia, I've never experienced anything like that. And when we opened 28, it was kind of the first thing what those business dudes said, that we're gonna have those reviews every six months and we're gonna tell people how good they've done or they didn't do well. Uh, we're gonna tell them this is your career path with us. Uh, we brought two kids, uh, they are with me today, they're still asleep because they're jet lagged, but uh, uh, we actually spent the money on them and brought them into, uh, into Tales and we've done every last three years. Uh, and they know that if do, but they do well, they will get paid this trip uh, to Tales of the Cocktails or to Berlin Barcom and et cetera, et cetera. So that said, it's kind of common sense that you have to give them a good uh, path or career track so they can kind of hold on to it and feel that it's important or they, they're important for the company because they're gonna grow within the company. But because Singapore was kind of starting up, uh, we kind of luckily uh, together all of us sense that that would not cut it. It would not only work that way because they would be on their own and, and no one else would be around. So we kind of said, well, let's use 28 and really build community. So there will be another army of 100 bartenders and waitresses and people who are very excited about this industry and they really see it as a career and they kind of can hold on to each other and they can see each other growing and then so we have numerous of competitions which are organized just for the community uh, we anytime anyone come in and do guest bartending shifts we always bring them to all of the other bars and we've done that for the last two and a half years and now we can see that it's turning around when jigger and pony have uh, guest bartenders from all around the world, they bring them to 28. And when Cuffling Club da has the same thing, they, you know, they share the love and they share the talent which comes from around the world and all of the new spirits and booze. And we, now it's got into the stage that bars are sending each other cocktails. The bartenders would send from regulars cocktails from one bar to another bar just to have a little bit of laugh and, and have a little bit of fun. So community uh, in your market is very, very important. Uh, to keep your staff and make staff happy and ex excited about a career and then, then the, the actual career path. Beautiful. Um, Ryan, you're talking about a lot about your mission statement and your vision as well. And some of the other bars that you've worked at in the past, um, ha obviously you've had clear mission statements. Have they ever changed? Um, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> Uh, I think, so the, the bar I was involved in previously before I went out on my own, um, it, it kind of kept the same ethos. So it was a bar called The Whistling Shop. Uh, and some old friends had asked me to come on board to be the creative manager of, of kind of bringing this vision to life. And they, they gave me a very broad kind of palette to be able to put something together. They basically said, you know, they wanted to take inspiration from a Victorian gin palace but bring it into the modern day. Uh, and so the, the whole concept and the and the program of the cocktails was based around that idea and it was working with their vision around it. Um, and it's been, actually it's really nice to see how that gets taken on as a, as a basis and a legacy after I, I left that project. Um, I don't think it's changed in its, its DNA as such, right. but it's very much evolved and I think that's, that's really important and it's something that I'm doing with White Lion as I pass it on to, you know, it's, you know, the, the, the vision of it is mine, but it's the, you know, it's, it's very much like I want the staff to take ownership of that. It's, it's almost their baby in that sense, so they can then take this on and grow it in a way that it becomes theirs. And you know, it's because, especially with White Lion, it's a bar where you know it's so involved from the bartender side. You're looking after people. That's it's a it's a host, hosting role. That's what you're doing in that bar. So you know, it's really important they take ownership of that and feel that they've got their own stamp on it to be able to bring that on an everyday level. Because if they're just there, and you know, I I, I hope that all my my team kind of believe in the same kind of objective. But it's, it's obviously really important for them to be able to, to have a, a sense of pride and a sense of ownership in it that they can translate, they, translate that onto guests as they come through the bar. Um, but I think it is inevitable that the, I don't think that the concept will change, but the, the kind of feeling of it, the translation right. of it will. From, from my point of view, the way I've always kind of set up any cocktail programs, be it my own or for a consultancy, is I kind of operate it a bit like a kitchen. I, I had a background being in as a chef. and one of the things I really learned is chefs don't make your meal a la menu. If they did, you'd wait hours for your food in the restaurant. 
So preparation is is utmost. So the amount you can do kind of to make your life easier. So you're not, you know, you're not picking up six bottles to make one drink. Um, you, you, that time you save, you're doing the right thing and you're looking after the people in front of you. So anything that you can do, I mean, it's, it's really site specific. So it's very hard to give kind of specific examples of what you could do. Uh, but even, you know, I, I'm a big advocate of, obviously for White Lion, it's, it's quite key, but kind of even batching things. So whenever I've done an event, say if I've got to serve 200 people in, in half an hour, you can vat the spirit base. You know, if you know you're gonna sell those drinks out, you don't have to worry about the perishability of it either. So you could put, you know, juices in it if you know you're gonna sell it in that night. Um, but anything you can do to kind of cut down those steps on the service side is just gonna help you immeasurably. So I, I, I hope it doesn't sound too obvious, but preparation is as much as you can. I mean, just a one little note to add to that uh, as Everything what Ryan just said is 100% is true. And a couple of years ago, it was kind of embarrassing if you would say that you pre-mix your cocktails. But that's not the case anymore as you know, you can kind of black it on that you, you make loads of things homemade and that how it has to be done and you do loads of prep work. But uh, if you want, I'll give you my details at the end. And what we use in 28 is it's a very simple spreadsheet in Excel, but it kind of breaks down your whole menu into a groups and a, a few different uh, tables, which works together. And you can very easily separate your menu on uh, groups of alcohol and groups of different modifiers and then different purees and different syrups and different liqueurs you make homemade but make it in a way that if you see it on a paper you can cross reference it and you can put them in different drinks and that makes it very very simple and easy to make very balanced menu where you're not missing any base spirit or you're not missing any drastic out of the five flavors as a sweet sour bitter etc etc but you can reuse ingredients in them so I can give you that if you're interested in that, and that's, that's definitely the way how you can speed yourself up. Rather than doing 40 different cocktails, doing 15, and try to cut down all of the ingredients down as much as you can, so the prep doesn't take ages, and at the same time, it's not hectic behind the bar to have 40 different bottles. My new favorite word um, from Jacob Breyers, instead of using the word batching, is pre-organizing. Let's <laughs> use that one. Uh, gentlemen, thank you so much. Thank you.